Now coming up next is another panel discussion on the subject STEM learning, implementation, and learning outcomes. STEM learning is becoming increasingly important as it helps to bridge the gap between curriculum and the job market. What are the best practices for implementing STEM curricula? Please put your hands together for our upcoming panelists who will answer all these STEM questions. I just want to thank the Education 2.0 uh, organization for inviting us all to here today to share a, some amazing expertise by the panel that we have here. And so what we're going to do first is go through a little um, introduction. And um, as someone who's um, getting older, remembering what everyone else does is something that I forget. So we have some slides so you won't forget as well. So Latoya. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm excited to be here today. As you can see on the sky, I'm an author, wife, mommy of three, teacher, consultant, and an entrepreneur of several businesses. I am, I specialize in all things education, early childhood. I am a STEM lab facilitator for pre, uh, elementary school. I teach pre-K through fifth. And not only am I an educator at heart, I'm an author of a children's book. Um, the STEM in me gave me the idea of merging technology and reading together. During my 23 years of teaching and mentoring, I observed that pre-K through fifth um, were the critical stage in development. Um, so I especially um, specialize in emotion. So that's what drove me to write my children's book and merge technology and reading together. Um, thank you. All right. Next, this is alphabetic. So there we go. I'm Shelly Hunt. Uh, I'm the crazy lady that thinks I could change the world. I have the Women of Global Change. We do educational and social impact. We have about 500,000 members around the world, and it's an honor to be here. When they ask me to be here, it's a little bit different um, for my speaking genre, but in all my work of traveling around the world, I've come to the conclusion of, <laughs> after 57 years, that education if we could give education around the world, we could change the world in one generation and elevate humanity. And that's why I'm here. All right, thank you. Melissa. So hi, uh, my name is Melissa LaDuke. Uh, I currently teach in higher ed, so I'm one of those uh, end users, uh, uh, workforce users that the first panel uh, mentioned. So, uh, in addition to STEM background and doing a lot of uh, STEM research for the Air Force, I actually am an active duty Air Force member. Um, I do teach at National Intelligence University. I've taught at the Air Force Academy, um, all in, in the science field. So um, I, I really believe that if we focus on authentic education and, and, and addressing problems, like global problems, um, that, that our education system will be better and our students will be more prepared for the workforce. Okay, Usha. Hi, um, I'm Usha Priya Ravilla. Um, I'm an uh, investor and entrepreneur. My entrepreneurial experience is for a decade, like 10 years. Prior to that, um, I was a senior vice president of the company in a financial institution, um, heading global um, organizations. But you know, you have always that inner feeling that you know, you're not doing the right thing. What is that? That is something is not satisfying me. So, um, so I actually set two missions in my life. One is educating the youth, preparing them for the future generation. The second one is protecting the earth. What are we leaving behind for their next generation? So I set two missions in my life. Then I started my first um, entrepreneurial track in 2012. So I started my first institution and then 2015 as, as a second one. So 2017, I completely came out of the corporate life. And I got my first startup company um, <clears throat> called Terra Mirai. It's a Earth's future. Um, that's when I think you must, you must be still remembering the tortoise completely crumbled in the plastic nest. So 
I wanted to do my contribution of um, to the community. So I started with completely eco-friendly disposable products. It's like literally like fallen leaves, take that and then uh, make a product out of it. It's 100% disposable, 100% disposable, you can just throw into the garden, right? So the one, uh, as part of that, I um, went with like um, 600 farmers, like, you know, wanted to empower women. So 600 farmers, we gave missionaries and then like do the production and the distribution of all of those things. But in 2018, I started like, you know, when I was doing the education institution, primarily it was K to nine. So then I started with like, you know, what am I going to do for the high school? So then I started another company called Unique Prep. Um, so you can see that I'm the co-founder of Unique Prep and then like, you know, Atara Marai. Right. But when COVID came, everything was crushed. I'm sure like we were going to talk about this whole COVID thing as well. But um, that is when I saw the whole education space when we had to completely move on to digital. So many problems. Teachers were spending more than 50 to 60% of their time on lesson planning, preparations, grading, communications. Students were literally doing the handwriting. The handwriting skills were lost. How many of you remember that like, you know, your child coming to you, mom, can you please print, download this and print it and raise your hands. Everyone, right? So, and you know, when students have to go through that whole endless life cycle of uploads and downloads, the students' handwriting were lost. So, and the moreover, how many of you know that in the US, it's 54 billion sheets of paper were used in schools. We are cutting down 4 million trees. So I wanted to solve all of those problems and that's when that whole EdQuil was formed. So all my ventures are primarily towards education, healthy lifestyle and then organic side of it. So I just don't want to take you more on this and then I'll hand it over. I just want to know who you guys remember the stories of each one, like you know who we are. Okay. And Victoria. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I am currently a high school science teacher at King School in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, <clears throat> my primary role there is to teach 10th grade chemistry, but I also have some upper level junior and senior electives um, that really take kids, kids learning off campus. So there at King School, I am the director of science research and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and I run a program, an advanced STEM research program where students are either placed in a lab in New York City or in Yale, which is both of which are about an hour from our campus. And the students perform a research project under guided mentorship and then they bring that work back to the school and I teach them how to write a paper, pre prepare poster presentations, PowerPoint presentation, and, and then they go on the science fair circuit at local, state, regional, and hopefully national and international competitions. Um, my program has been fairly successful and I'm proud to say that for the last three years we have podiumed top five at all of the state and regional competitions that we've entered and we've had um, qualifying appearances at every international and national competition available to our students. So um, I know the earlier panel today was talking about how experience is really going to drive education in the future. I could not agree more, which is why I built this program from the ground up and um, I use my, my company outside of school to bring that same opportunity to students that are not at King. Uh, it, it's, it's a private school with a pretty steep tuition, so I wanted to make sure that there was equal access for students in you know, the neighboring public schools that may not have the ability to, to attend King School um, and really bring those opportunities to everyone because I want to close that equity gap as well and bring experiential learning to all students. Great, thank you, Victoria. Uh, my name's Jerry Hanley. Uh, I am a recovering administrator in higher education. I, I've spent uh, 44 years teaching at, uh, in higher ed and the last 20 has been as the uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Technology uh, for the California State University System, serving 500,000 students and 28,000 faculty members who work in peace and harmony. Um, I'm also the Executive Director of Merlot and Skills Commons, which are free open libraries of educational content. Uh, Skills Commons is in workforce development and Merlot is in academic, all available for you, everyone around the world. And right now I'm the chief academic officer and trying to build partnerships between education and commercial providers to bring education more, uh, innovation more effectively into higher ed. And, um, and we have 
Uh, some questions, a lot of times people ask questions and we all forget what the heck did someone ask us to do. So I'm gonna start out just recognize again from pre-K to, tw to 12, higher ed, workforce training. Uh, the panel before said we need to disrupt. Well, COVID did huge disruptions in the way education was delivered. And now the question is, what do we do now that we have? And so asking the panelists, what do you see as the essential service and thinking about, in a sense, in the next year, what do you think we can help take advantage of the disruption and move it forward to enable successful STEM education? And now it's free for all. Who wants to go first? I can go first. Um, I primarily work with like K to 12. Right, like so my education institutions were primarily K to 12 as well. Um, again, COVID wasn't an easy, um, I mean, it, it, I think it really impacted every single one across, not only in the workforce, it's primarily the students are the major um, impact. In the education institutions, like, you know, we have like new students who come in, when we evaluate them, they are literally two to three years behind. So when second graders, they don't even know how to write ABCD. Right? Like, you know, when uh, this is the first time in the year, first time in actually since ACT has, the standardized testing was implemented, the lowest score reported. So I was talking to some of the underrepresented schools and they said they were actually brought it on par and now they are like 10 years behind. So we don't know how much time it's going to take them to bring the students up forward. So what are all the things that we can do? Like you know, even the, the platform that which I have created, Edquil, is a learning management plot platform where we literally, the, stu the teachers have a lot of their time. Like you know, you might be seeing, this is the first year, so many teachers have quit their jobs. There is a huge vacancy as educators. Why? When I was doing the research and talking to so many educators, they were saying, they are just literally tired. They are burnt out. The reason it's because they have like, you know, every week they have to prepare the lesson plans. I was asking them, you already have lesson plans. Why do you have to be keep doing it again and again? Because as per the district's re requirement, maybe I'm like wrong, but this is what the feedback that I got from the teachers. I said, okay, in the platform, what you can do is you have already prepared your lesson plan. You can form the curriculum. You can assign it to the students. And then students literally handwrite all of those things in the digital, either using the iPad or on iOS. And you can visually see the students work. Because the teachers don't have time, they don't, they are not able to see what the students are working on. They are not able to, if the students are doing it wrong, they are not able to put back into their queue, you know what, can you rework on it? There is no adaptive methodology that's being implemented in every school to make sure the child is literally learning, learning and retaining what they are learning. It's not that like, you know, okay, no, due to no behind, uh, no child left behind act. It's not just keep moving forward them, forward for the grades. We have to ensure we are preparing them well enough in their curriculum and what they are learning. There are too many applications. The digital landscape is like expanding like anything, right? It's going to be really hard for the educators like to go into different, different platforms and assigning them for different um, assignments and there's no tracking mechanism. Parents have no clue on what the child is working on. So how do we solve all of these problems? So we are actually built, a, we are working on building like a marketplace where the curriculum providers can come in and uh, they can um, easily assign under one place, they can easily assign the curriculum to the students and the teachers can visually track all of their work. They can put it back into their queue if they are not like, you know, um, uh, if they have to do the rework on it, communications, everything. So we want to save the teachers time, giving back students cognitive skills and memory retention by using their handwriting skills and also of course saving the planet, right? So that's like Edquil does. But what I'm trying to say is, during, after the COVID, since we have a huge gap, we have to bring back the project-based learning, experimental learning. That is when the students can retain what they can, what they are learning, right? So the most important thing that at least like from my side, what I would say is bring back, instead of not just like focusing on keep moving forward, 
ensure every child is learning and retaining what they are learning. Yeah. And since experiential learning, Victoria. Yes, and then, I was going to tag right onto okay, that. Okay. Yep. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little under the weather. Anyway, uh, so for for experiential learning, I I agree 100%. Um, there's a book who's the author of which whose name is escaping me right now, but the book is called In Search of Deeper Learning. It points out that in 1970, the top three skills that employers were looking for were reading, writing, and arithmetic, the three R's. Nowadays, they're looking for problem solving, creative thinking and innovation, and also critical thinking. So you have to you have to be able to teach the children how to use the knowledge that they have to solve a new problem. And that's where the application comes in. And one thing that I think that COVID has actually done a favor to the education world is that by disrupting our normal stand and deliver, give the lectures, I can't remember who was mentioning that earlier, um, the, what happened in my particular school and area is we had to go into co cohorts and we had to teach half the class on Zoom and half the class in the room at the same time. It was, in, it was near impossible. But I had come across um, something called the Modern Classrooms Project that I now do a little bit of side work for as well. I highly recommend everyone check it out. Um, they, they, they purport that you need to make all of your lecture content in short little videos. And I was amazed at how I could take a 50 minute lecture and condense it down to eight minutes. And I, then I thought, well, what was I doing for the other 42 minutes of that class time? And so I really took this to heart, reflected a lot, and turned the modern classrooms approach where they have all the lectures in little videos. Those are now my homework. So someone mentioned a flipped classroom. Those are now the homework for my class. And in the class, we actually have more time to do lab activities, more time to solve those problems, more time to have those problem, problem um, project-based learning opportunities to solve problems and see how they can use the content that they have, not to simply regurgitate it to me on a test, but actually apply it to a real world problem. And that's, that's where we start in 10th grade, or at least that's where I start. <clears throat> and then if they enjoy that process, I then recruit those students to go on to the elite level experiences where they're now going out into the world. Um, and I place them in lab, at, lab um, institution or sorry labs at institution in both New York City and New Haven and you know now I have students who are trying to find a cure for tuberculosis they are trying to build a water fuel cell that desalinates the water and changes the acidity of the ocean in a, in a good direction and they're trying to build um, HVAC systems that don't require so much energy to make it cool so that we don't give off so many carbon emissions so these are the things that my students are doing after they learn how to think and um, I've always said to my students, I'm not here to tell you what to think, I'm here to teach you how to think. And so with all the content that they're getting, most of my tests, um, my students take a little time to understand how I'm going to test them. Um, there's very little, if any, rote, rote memorization and regurgitation on my tests. I give them all the information they need, and then their questions on their tests are actually gonna ask them how they would solve new scenario A or B, and then they have to apply that information. So. I feel that that direction, which I can't take full credit for because, again, I did some PD with the Modern Classrooms Project and that was really helpful. Um, but if they learn to think that way, they will take the ground or the foundational information and build it from the ground up into something that can really be innovative and create a solution for something that is a real world problem. That's where I think we need to go. And I'm actually grateful for COVID for kind of jolting my, my stand and deliver moments. <laughs> so now I do very little, if any, straight lecturing and the students love it. And in fact, in a year that I thought my students' grades were going to go down severely because of the COVID pandemic and all of the strange half in the classroom, half out, the scores actually went up. And I asked the students why, and they said, well, in a real lecture, if you miss a moment, the moment is gone. But with these videos, they can stop, they can pause, they can go back, they can rewind, they can watch it again the night before the test. Um, and then they're actually also applying that information. And when they apply it, they retain it, just, just like Usha was saying. So that's what I, that's how I feel on that one. Great. Thank you, Victoria. And now, to be ready for your classroom, what do they have to do in an elementary school to be prepared to be that STEM person who's going to cure cancer in high school? So, yes, um, my classroom is all things PBL, which is Project Based Learning. The children will come in and... Um, will have assignments, but they learn basically through play. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, um, a lot of children um, are not getting the character development that they need at, the, at that particular age. 
So, and they're growing into teenagers and adolescents without the skills needed. For instance, the emotional awareness piece that um, results in fights and emotional conflicts with others, with their peers. And um, the curriculum that um, I um, created is all things social and emotional. And um, I put a little spin to it. Um, this book is augmented reality. So the kids not only because um, they have technology, they're, they take technology and they can use it in media ways. So I try to think, how can I merge that and bring back reading fun again, you know? So I created an augmented reality book where it teaches all things um, emotional learning. And yeah, and it's just, STEM is just an awesome thing because it lets them think out of the box. And like she said, you get to make those lessons those condensed lessons down to like eight minutes and they can relate to that instead of sitting there and trying to figure out, okay, what is my teacher really trying to say? Excellent, excellent. And Shelly, do you wanna, uh, or Melissa? So uh, I'll talk while she's having the uh, cough break. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's it's amazing to hear uh, what, what these talented individuals are doing in the K through 12 realm because you know I am the the beneficiary uh, in higher ed, and I can say from my experiences during COVID, I was teaching uh, I was teaching chemistry, uh, and everything was in classroom. And I think that especially at the the higher ed level, uh, not only do we focus so much on uh, teacher centered learning, um, we especially in STEM I, I teach chemistry as well, so uh, we have an over-reliance on, we have labs, so that means it's an experience, right? We have experiential learning just due to the nature of the, the curriculum, right? And, and the nature of, of the class. Um, but when COVID happened and we no longer could do labs in person, uh, it was a big shock on how do we actually teach our students in a meaningful way. Um, so I think that, for my class, I already made it more student-centered, so my uh, I was very grateful that my students really didn't see a change in the classroom experience when we went fully online. Uh, so we, we did about, what, a semester, half a semester on Teams. Um, and we, uh, we in that, um, in that class, we also had taped all of the labs for people to use it as reference. So we were a little ahead in, in that area, not knowing that COVID happened. Um, but they, the students could then watch the labs instead of doing the labs online. But I think one of the essential services, especially in, in higher ed that we can do is, is two things. And, and it really focuses around instructor development, right? So we need to focus a lot on both teaching instructors how to reach students where they are, less reliance on lecture, more reliance on actual project and student-centered learning um, and, and that critical thinking uh, development. But we also need to focus on informing our instructors and on how to use technology efficiently, right? And to best help our students. Uh, most of us, you know, you still see it in college. They're the sage on the stage and they're writing on the blackboards or now whiteboards, right? Um, but we know that we have to move to this hybrid environment because we're reaching global students. Um, so I think those are the two biggest things that we can focus on. Um, okay. Thank you. Shelly? Thank you <laughs> for covering for me, sister. I appreciate that. <laughs> it does. Um, you know, I think being the mother of a daughter that is 100% dyslexic gave me some insight into some of the systems and different thinking. And so I'm not really a teacher, though I, I teach women's leadership, right? But um, I do go out into the community and I am a mom. And what I knew was that my daughter was smart enough but I knew that she couldn't fit the systems. And she went to math and she kept flunking. She was in fifth grade. And I already knew when she came home in second grade from, you know, mom, look, well, first grade, whatever it is, I wrote one to 100 and I looked at the paper and I went, all right. <laughs> Everything was backwards, right? 
And she was ready to quit. And she went into junior high and she said to me, and she had a teacher, first off, that ridiculed her, made fun of her. And of course, I went into the classroom and I sat across from the teacher and I walked out going, oh my God, what, you're teaching the future. What the heck are you teaching? What are you doing? I brought in a math professor and I said, you know, uh, let her study, you know, like a, to, to teach her at home. He said, she's brilliant. I said, then what's the problem? He said, she's not doing the problem the way it's supposed to be done, but she's coming up with the right answer. She just was working in Capitol Hill. She's a top 1% lawyer in the United States right now. But I discovered she needed to win somewhere. She needed to feel her passion. And so, you know, I totally, I think teachers are the most underpaid, underappreciated career that we have around the world. You know, I mean, I see sports players raking it in. And please hear me, I, I like sports, okay. However, why are we not honoring our teachers with that kind of pay, with that kind of educational forward thinking? And I think, you know, after seeing my daughter who came to me in seventh grade and said, Mom, I don't think I'm going to make it through high school. And she was dead serious. And I went, this kid is trying to win everywhere she can. But in this system, she cannot win. I think identifying, we all have gifts and talents, we all have causes, whether it's the earth. And if you ask a young child, I've had child children as young as six years old come in and say, I wanna save animals. Okay, then let's make you an author. The youngest author I've mentored is a, is a six-year-old little girl. And she went so proud. And I think that, you know, there's been so many good points here. You know, I love the experiential because I think COVID has put us so inward and that's why TikTok and all these things are doing so good. They're short, they're succinct, and they're experiential. Nobody's gonna sit there and listen for an hour to After a while, it just, it's like, what is it, the peanuts? Womp, 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 womp. Tune out. And so that something they can smell and feel and touch. And educating our educators to not poo poo on the different thinkers that are outside the box of our system. Our educational system in the United States was written so long ago, it, it infuriates me. Come on. Can we have conflict resolution? I was watching those videos when I walked in, that one girl who said, I just didn't feel good about myself or my body. Well, all the social media doesn't help. Now they're just getting it from the outside, not just the inside. And so how can our kids win? Like, really, like, what is your calling? What is your passion? It's the earth, it's animals. It's whatever it is. And how do we bring that in? Because I'll tell you, STEM is needed. Innovation is needed. And women in these areas are needed. We think differently. Our brains work differently. I love men. Hear me again, right? It's like the sports team. I love them too. But we think differently. We're wired differently. And so for me, it's, you know, how do we fight for our educators to be revered, to be respected? I was so tired of walking into these schools and I've redone so many schools that weren't even up to code. And teachers are barely making money and they're pulling money out of their pocket for their students because they're dedicated to tomorrow. And when do we get dedicated enough to tomorrow to make a difference?
that every child matters. And I mean that around the world. And I'm a, that's my calling, is children. And I just know after COVID, being able to experience, being able to find an area that I'm passionate about, and that even if it's a small win, that child will stay in education. Even if it's a small win. And so that's all I have. Yeah, I just want to add on a couple of points, like, you know, uh, on to that. I completely agree that um, the workforce, right? Like, you know, we, are, we keep talking about we have to make our children career ready. How are we making them career ready? When they go to school, I mean, you, you know this these days, going into college for undergrad is so expensive. The college tuition fees has been increasing heavily year over year. Like I pay for my son $70,000 per year just going into Emory, like for undergrad. If he has to go to medicine, $120,000 per year. It's, it's very important we prepare them in K to 12 itself what is their passion? What is that they know? Give them the opportunities to connect with the industry experts, like internships, and give them the platform so that the children can identify what is that they are really good at so that they can pursue that career. They can pursue for that career, doing undergrad or grad in the college, and then they'll be really, really ready for the college, right? Can we give our kids a reputation to live up to, please? Yeah. Okay. My daughter came in in seventh grade and she said, this is a list of careers. I said, I don't see president of the United States on there. I don't see attorney general. I don't see a prima ballerina. Like it was all really the low thing. grade. I mean, can yeah. we give them a reputation to live up to? Exactly. You know, that's what I'm saying. Like it's uh, we have to give them the exposure you know, in K to 12, like, you know, just start from elementary. Maybe the elementary is too young, but at least start from middle school. And that's the most important thing that is really the school reformation need to be done to prepare them for the career readiness. And the other point that she mentioned is about the, the teachers are undervalued and underappreciated. I totally agree with that. In Hong Kong, the school teachers are highly paid. They are paid equivalent to traders. So they can form the very good output of the students. But here, the teachers are quitting. It's because they are either undervalued or underappreciated and they are extremely overloaded. So I think it's like overall policy makers and administrators and everyone has to make the change. It's like, you know, we sit here cannot make those changes, but it's just uh, always the pain point. Right, like, you know, when we are educating, I'm sure every educator would agree with me. All right, and let's go to the next question because I think we've started to address this. Um, when we're looking from K-12 to workforce, the diversity, the various needs that our students have, the uniqueness that they bring to the table continues to expand. And so, how are our educational institutions down at K-12 through higher ed to workforce development, how are we gonna ensure that there are inclusive strategies to ensure these equitable outcomes for opportunity and, um, and, and workforce um, development? And focus in on particularly on STEM, right? On, on those particular areas there. So if I could, I'll start. Okay. I'll start with this one. Um, so, so one of my uh, volunteer, uh, um, I, I've had the pleasure to volunteer. I'm the chair for the Inclusion and Equity Committee for the American Association of University Women. And we focus a, a lot on, on growing females in, in STEM and in, in careers and, and just being equal, right? Because we all know, uh, unfortunately, hopefully we all know that uh, women still aren't being paid or treated equally in the workplace, especially in, in STEM fields. So, um, so one is just publicity, right? And making the issue known, especially um, when we look at 
the various dimensions of diversity, right? And we focus on, on the big ones, um, gender, ethnicity. But there's also just uh, diversity of thought, right? Um, we have folks from different socioeconomic statuses that have different experiences and, and different abilities, right, based on uh, where they grew up or how they grew up. So making uh, STEM education and STEM opportunities uh, more equal and equitable, uh, I think is, is key. Uh, at National Intelligence University, we actually partner with uh, a college in Florida that is a historically black uh, college and un university to uh, expose them to project-based learning within the intelligence community, right? And we, um, we expose them to real world problems that they can help solve, um, but also it gives them an in, and it is all STEM-based, uh, but it also kind of gives them an in for what they can do when they graduate. So it's a whole different field, a whole different careers that they may not know exist. Um, so I think that that's a big thing that we can do. And another thing that we can do is, is literally be the mentors. Like Shelly said, right? Um, studies have shown that someone will want to come into that field, whatever that field is, if they see someone that looks like them in it, right? But once they're in the field, they'll just find someone that they agree with, like that train of thought that they can learn from. So if we really want to expose more people to STEM education or any field, we need to make sure that we pair them up or expose them to people that look like them, which means we need to educate a, a big variety of folks so that there are more diverse mentors in these fields. I'm just gonna add on to that. Um, you know, <clears throat> I, it was interesting, Gary, cause you're at Cal State Long Beach and I go in on their business strategy competitions and I've been in engineering and innovation and taught there and even had a winning team there at one point. I loved it, it was so much fun. Um, but when I looked at the marketing material, not a, Long Beach, but of other colleges, because I, one of my things is advertising and marketing. And um, the colleges had brought me some of the, um, the, the, their paperwork, their, you know, their advertisements. And I looked at this and I went, that doesn't look like fun at all. It was engineering, some guy in a hard hat looking all dirty. I'm like, you know, and so I think when it comes to I totally tag on to what you're saying. One, when you see someone and you go, that I can see me in that. I can see another woman. Like engineering to me is totally exciting. It's totally innovative and creative. And it looked like I was gonna be in a work field of oil workers. I was like, oh no, I'm out <laughs> as a woman, you know? And so I think how we're presenting this to our kids early on, you know, and I really think it does start at the end, in the very beginning. You know, we go to, okay, it's sixth, seventh, eighth grade, we worry about high school, and here's your list of what you can be. <laughs> but I think having that sense of pride and winning and engaging in education, and if I make a mistake, it's okay, and you know, all of those really great learning principles that go into that creative aspect, I think happens really young, but I totally want to tag on with what you're saying. We've got to make it so it's relatable on what they're seeing and what they're experiencing out there. So in, in one other thing, sorry to tag in with that, and then like the importance of, of what this side of the stage is doing. Uh, multiple studies have also shown that that elementary school and middle school is really important for the development of uh, STEM and, and just uh, diversity of STEM in the workforce. Um, and these studies range from male and female students have the same aptitude in elementary school, but they diverge in middle school and women go towards the soft sciences and, and men go uh, towards the hard sciences because of the environment. They're told like that's the way that they're supposed to, to go. Um, but it also goes from uh, teachers at lower socioeconomic schools limit their students by thinking that they can't achieve more, right? And I'm not saying that people in this room are doing it because clearly we're here and we want to be better, right? But there are folks that are out there that do that. Um, and 
so so it's meeting our students where they are, giving them the belief in themselves by be actually believing in them that they can achieve whatever they want and showing them that. And that that is so powerful because and once we start believing in our children, it makes them want to work harder. Um, for instance, when I'm, I'm a STEM facilitator, so that's what I do. I facilitate. So when um, I bring forth a project, I look at the kids' faces and they're like, I can't, um, they, I, they might talk to themselves or talk to their neighbor, I can't do this. And, you know, I, and I tell them, can't is not a word in my room. Um, we, we strive for excellence. We strive for implementing different strategies to work out the problem. And at the end of that lesson or, or, or that project-based material, they get it. And it's, it's awesome to see that light bulb go off. And it's awesome to say, oh, yeah, I can do this. You know, so even at that, at that lower, lower age of pre-K to fifth, they can do it. They can do it. So I think it's more of a bottom-up approach, right? As I said, like, you know, it has to start from elementary to all the way to the top level. So there are two parts here. One is the diversity. So in workforce, it is proven, the research has been proven, when you have a diversified culture of like the men and women in the room, as you said, the brain, the wires are different, right? You'll come up with like a lot more ideas and to do implementation in any place. So when workforce has to bring in a diversified culture, men or like in any ethnicity, into the, um, into the company, right? If you see that like just for STEM, um, the graduation rate, if you look at it, right? The women who gra undergrad, like you know, for engineering is like a higher percentage, but if you really look at STEM, it's a very low percentage. Similarly for the ethnicity, like you know, the underrepresented population is definitely STEM major, only like 10 to 15% are the STEM majors graduates. They are not being equipped enough because they feel that even that preliminary courses when they take it, they are not able to do it. So Northeastern University, and there are like few universities in Washington, they are really, really doing well and their like graduation rate is like 90% and primarily for STEM. It's because they give like Northeastern University if you take it, they have more than 210,000 corporate companies tie-ups are there. They give co-op programs. I'm not sure why many universities are not doing that. So they give the opportunities for the students to go in and then get them experience, like Drexel University in Pennsylvania. If the students are doing BSMS, they give six co-ops. More than they are in the actual uh, colleges, they are in the co-ops. And they go and get their actual real-time experience it gives them the, um, the real exposure on the STEM field, they graduate. So when the students are in elementary and middle school and high school, the most important thing, as she, Melissa was talking about, is a mentorship. Give them the experience of the mentors. If a, if a child is like, you know, doing it, okay, that, she may not even know what an Air Force is. She may not even get an idea what an Air Force thing that they can do, right? So. The mentorship is the most important thing and the giving them the experience from the ground up and so that it can be prepared when the students are going into the undergrad, they have get the hands-on experience, they are really prepared for the workforce, workforce can hire the diversified people. Yeah, I guess I'll wrap this one up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think there's a couple of things at play here, as many have said. Um, not only to be inclusive for different populations, as I mentioned before, I work at a a private school where the tuition is quite steep and um, you know we have some wonderful programs at that school but I've also recognized you know if I look down the street there is the public high school and they have a different demographic uh, just you know they're just limited by the funds and that really bothers me a lot um, I'm often wondering if I'm contributing to the equity gap problem not the solution which is why I work outside of the school with the same sorts of uh, mentality mentorship etc for students who want that opportunity but may not have the the bank account or the check to be able to come to the school that I actually work at. Um, fortunately, my administration is okay with that. And even if they weren't, we'd have other issues to talk about. <laughs> um, but also inside King School, um, I run a, a club called Girls Advancing in STEM. And if you take the letters of that and both letters of in, it spells gains. And so that's where I really try to focus on closing the gender equality gap um, and highlighting to the, to the girls that 
you can be the president. You can be an, an engineer. And an engineer is not a man in a hard hat looking all dirty. It can be a computer science engineer. You can build a, an algorithm that, you know, the National Security Agency wants to use. Um, so we, I try to expose those students to a lot of different opportunities and bring in speakers of different backgrounds, different ethnic cultures, um, and in different, most most importantly, in different careers, so that the girls can see what their their possibilities could actually be. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to throw out there is something that you had said: "Can't" is not a word in your your um, uh, classroom. I, I've often had people come to the school and say that I'm pushing my students too hard, and I push back on that all the time. And you know, when someone says, "Oh, well, they're too young to do this. They're too young to go to New York City and work on a high-level research project with an NIH grant," I say, "Okay, well, did you learn how to ride a bike by not riding the bike? You've, you've got to get on the bike. You've got to try. You've got to fall off. You've got to scrape. I mean, I have a." pretty nasty scar on my hand when I was trying to teach my daughter how to ride a bike. But you know what? She got back up, she got on, and she can ride a bike now. She did not learn, though, by not getting skinned, not getting, not taking those risks. So you can't learn to ride a bike by not riding a bike. And so just like you were saying, I push them, and we'll see how far we can go. And that's really how you're going to open the doors for students, both with what's available to them, what they think they can do, which is very important, just as she was saying, and then also um, bringing those same opportunities to people in your community, not just your workplace. That's something that's really important to me. I, I just want to add only one more thing, because just talking about all of this, it really... My daughter, she was in... When she graduated from middle school, they select only 32 students for, like, STEM field and a specialized school, all right? So she got one among that, and she got into the other private schools for getting into... And she really wanted to be a genetic. And then that's when, like, you know, mom, I want to get into the STEM field. Okay, she went into the school. But, you know, uh, don't take me wrong here because the school, they are thinking that, like, you know, being STEM school, they are preparing them. Instead of giving them real life, they were literally put everything on a college level courses. Too much of a pressure. She started, like, health issues. She started, like, you know, losing hair, becoming a bald, and she started losing confidence. And, at end, one point, like, you know, when she came to 10th grade, she said, I don't think I can do math and science at all. I'm not fit for that. Right? So she got, like, you know, different, like, lower level grades. And, like, you know, we were worried about whether she will be able to get into college. And at that point, I told her, you know what, I spoke to the principal. What is the reason we are sending the children to learn, not penalizing them to give the higher level of college level courses and bringing them down and losing the confidence? I moved her, I pulled her out of the school. I moved her to a different school, a private school. She's happy. She's bringing all her confidence back, right? And she is now wants to go back to the OBG gynec as a doctor, right? So the most, the reason I'm trying to tell is like, you know, we want children to enjoy the education, not getting penalized, but like, you know, just because of going to school. And STEM is the most, that's the future for all the students, that's a future. They have to know the science and engineering and technology and everything in order for them to survive in the next, like, you know, in the next five years. The workforce is, like, completely going to change, as the first panel said. We want to prepare our children for the future. Okay, and we're closing up, and I'm just going to make a few observations as one of the panelists here. Um, one, none of you talked about how we have to teach mitosis or Ohm's Law better, right? Okay. Right, it's all about, I'll say, who you are as an individual and how you have to help that person become a scientist, which is about questioning. And it's about how do you really um, stay with yourself even though you're going against convention, right? Because scientists have to ask a question that other people haven't asked. So a lot of that requires an issue of confidence the issue of experience, so, so that's one. The second in the last 10 seconds, I'll just say, is that encouragement, the mentorship process, where do people learn of what is possible? It's in modeling. So I think that's another theme. And whether you're in STEM or whether you're in psychology, like myself, right, this becomes an essential element. So thank you very much uh, for the panelists. Thank you all for listening. and. Uh, we're done. Thank you. Thank you.